はい、えー、ここからは、えー、パネル討論形式で、えー、アフリカのスタートアップとインパクト投資、えー、そして日本との連携可能性について、えー、議論を進めてまいりたいというふうに思っております。えー、私は、えー、日本経済新聞社編集員の下田と申します。えー、本日、えー、進行役を仰せつかりました。どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。よろしくお願いいたします。<笑>はい、えー、今日あのアフリカのスタートアップを取り上げるということで私ちょっと調べてまいりました、えー、このスタートアップという言葉なんですが、えー、最近1年間にですね日本経済新聞の超有感と電子版を合わせてなんと5376回も使われている言葉なんですね、えー、単純平均すると1日15回ほど登場していますので皆さんにもおなじみの言葉ではないかなというふうに思います革新的な技術やアイデアで、まあ、短期間に急成長する新興企業というふうに定義されておりまして、まあ、確かにシリコンバレー発のスタートアップは、まあ、革新的な技術こそが成長の源泉と言えると思いますけれども、まあ、私自身、アフリカのスタートアップはちょっと意味合いが違うのではないかなというふうに考えております。えーまあ、アフリカ発のスタートアップはです、ね、むしろそのデジタル技術の応用力というところに特徴があるように考えておりまして、まあ、このデジタル技術を駆使してです、ね、まさにアフリカで山積する社会課題をどう克服するかというあたりに主眼があるように感じております。実際、あのまあ、これまでかなりの、ね、スタートアップの起業家の方たちに、まあ、インタビューする機会がありましたけれども、まあ、起業の理由を尋ねると、まあ、例えば姉が出産の時にですに、ね、既得に陥ったと、まあ、アフリカ、今でもあの出産当日に病院に行っても、その日のうちに退院してしまうというような地域が結構多いので、産前産後の事故がすごく多いんですね。まあ、それで彼女はそれをきっかけに、まあ、妊産婦向けのスマホでのサポートサービスを始めたとかですね、また別の起業家は、おじがその心臓発作で自家用車で病院に向かう途中に、まあ、大渋滞に巻き込まれて、車内で亡くなったと、まあ、それゆえに民間の救急医療サービスを立ち上げましたというような、まあ、本当にそういうような回答がすごく多いんですね。実際、その医療などの行政サービスがなかなか行き届かない、そしてインフラも未整備なアフリカで、その若者たちがです、ね、民間の力でこういった社会課題を解決していこうと、それと合わせてビジネスとして育てていこうとしているという点をぜひ念頭に置かれた上でですね、これからのパネリストのお話皆さんのお話を聞いていただければというふうに思います。もう一つ、アフリカ経済のポテンシャルですけれども、これはこれまでね、講師の皆さんがかなりお話しされていましたし、これからもパネリストの皆さん、多分言及されるんじゃないかなと思いますので、私からは一言だけお話しさせてください。PPT お願いします。はい、えー、出るかな。はい昨年の夏にですねファイナンシャル・タイムズとの共同編集特集というのを執筆いたしまして、その時にトロント大学の世界トップメガシティに関する研究報告というのを記事の中で紹介させていただきました。この真ん中のですねちょっと上の方にアフリカの地図に重ねてあるグラフがそうなんですけれども、まあ、アフリカが今後、右肩上がりで人口が増えていくということはよく知られていますが、実はそれ以上にですねこのメガシティの顔ぶれというのがドラスティックに変わることが指摘されています。まあ、現在、世界のトップメガシティには、まあ、東京、ニューヨーク、上海といった都市が名を連ねているわけですが、2075年になるとですね、なんと世界最大のメガシティが、今後民主共和国の近社,近社差という都市になります。インドのムンバイが世界2位になりまして、世界3位がまたアフリカで、ナイジェリアのラゴスという顔ぶれになってくるんですね。他にもダルエスサラームとかハルツーム、ハルツームはちょっとここ1週間ぐらい、あのスーダンのニュースで、ね、皆さん耳にしたことあるかもしれませんけれども、ハルツームもです、ね、いずれ世界12位のメガシティになります。まあ、こういったちょっとあまり聞き覚えのないようなアフリカの都市がメガシティとして、これからどんどん成長してくると。世界トップ20のメガシティのうち、なんと7つをです、ね、アフリカの都市が占めるようになってまいります。この間、東京とニューヨークは、まあ、当然ながら順位を落とすわけですけれども、上海と北京に至ってはです、ね、もうトップ20からも姿を消してしまう
、まあ、これだけ大きな変化がこれから起こるということもぜひご認識をいただければと思いますありがとうございましたはい、ここからのパネル討論で、登壇者の皆様にご質問やご意見のある方、後ほど質疑応答の時間を作りますので、そこでどんどん質問してください。オンラインで参加されている方は、ズーム画面の中央に Q&A という機能があると思いますが、こちらの方に質問を書き込んで、私の方まで送ってください。時間の許す範囲で、皆さんの、ね、ご質問を交えて、さらに議論を深掘りしてまいりたいと思いますので、どうぞよろしくお願いをいたします。はい、ここからは英語でパネル討論を展開してまいりたいと思います。So, thank you very much for joining us today. We invite excellent panelists who can provide deep insight about the African market.、Uh, Dr. Akiyumi Adesina, the President of African Development Bank. Thank you very much. g o d a Makoto san, CEO of Nippon Biodiesel Fuel. Good afternoon. And Paresa, Paresa, can you hear me? Hi, Shimura. Yes, I can hear you. You look very nice today. Thank you. <laughs> so, Ms. Paresa o t a u n co founder of AgriCoop, she is from South Africa. Uh, Dr. Ayodele uh, Odusola, uh, resident representative UNDP South Africa. Dr. Odiusra.、Uh, Kawamura Hajime san, a senior consultant of Marbeni Corporation. Hello,、uh, good afternoon, everyone. And s i b i s a w a Ken san, vice chairman of Africa Project Team Keizai Do Yukai and the CEO of And Capital. Thank you very much. So, to begin with, Dr. Adesina, I'd like to ask you a question about the African tech market. So, it is well known that、uh, there are plenty of leapfrog opportunities in Africa, but、uh, tech companies all over the world are now facing with challenges、uh, like a slower funding、uh, environment. So, could you tell us、uh, what's your take on the current African tech market and African opportunities? Well, thank you very much. I think the When you think of Africa's market, you have to think of it in terms of the demographics of Africa itself. You know, as I said, you, know, you have a population of 1.4 billion people. That's a consumer market you cannot ignore. And also the fact that you're going to have you know, consumer and, and also、um, business expenditures on the continent being roughly $7 you know, trillion, you cannot also、uh, ignore, ignore that. But also the fact that Trading in Africa, Africa has 54 countries, and it's not always very easy to move around and to do business all, all, all across because of limited market sizes. But what has been done now with the Africa continental free trade area will actually lower the transaction cost of doing business all across Africa because it removes a lot of the tariffs、okay, mm -hmm. in, 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 in moving things from one place to the other. And、so that's a market that with cumulative GDP of roughly about $3.6 trillion. So that's a very, very huge market in Africa that you are uh, uh, talking about.、Mm -hmm. so, but potential is, is great, but nobody eats potential. And so, what we've got to make sure is that as we think of the Africa continental free trade area, it's not just going to be a market for others to supply things to. It should be a market in which Africa is actually focusing on manufacturing. In other words, industrial manufacturing is the key, right? Whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's in uh, uh, automobiles,、uh, whether it's in food and agriculture, you know, all the areas of the world that have actually turned their sizes into real economic power for themselves have done that through、um, uh, industrialization and industrial manufacturing. So I just want to say that that's very, very important for us to be able to,、uh, to, be able to, uh, to do that. So let me leave it there so I don't take too much of the time. So, just you know, the one more question. So, could you tell us you know, the, how the African economy has changed after digitalization? After? After digitalization. Or digitalization. Yeah. Well, Africa's economy has changed in, in, in many, many ways.、Um, take, for example, what has happened with the fintech. I was saying that in my,、uh, in my talk.、Um, you have today. That the number of fintech companies has tripled on the, 
uh, wow. on, on the continent, mm -hmm. right? And last year, I think 2021, they raised $5 billion, right? So, which is, you have like in Kenya, you the ambassador was here, you have Kenya, you have South Africa, Nigeria, you have Egypt. Uh, um, these are the big countries in which you have a lot of the fintech companies that are going, going through. You have today digitalization helping with e-governance. We support a lot of things at the bank, support better governance, better delivery of, 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 of services uh, to citizens. Uh, the second one, of course, is the use in different sectors. Take, for example, the case of agriculture. You have today people that are deploying drones uh, to be able to you know, collect information on weather patterns, to be able to deliver uh, market information prices to farmers via mobile phones. Mm -hmm. That is going quite a lot. Um, the Kenyans here will always talk about the M-Pesa, which is the money transfer system. You know, um, Africa alone accounts for roughly 70% of the $1 trillion mm. in mo you know, mobile money payment systems that mm. you have uh, in, in the world. So that tells you how important that is. So and indeed, it's a leapfrogging. Oh, you know, I'm not even sure what that leapfrogging really says. <laughs> because I always say that a frog can't leap far. Because, <laughs> it, I mean, what you need is a projectile. I think these are revolutionary things that are happening. Mm -hmm. For example, take the case of um, during um, health. It's very difficult in many parts of Africa to get access to, to health services, especially in rural areas. But today, you have the use of drones delivering blood in very difficult places uh, to get things to. That is a revolution uh, on its own. Mm -hmm. So I think that technology plays a very, very vital role. Innovation plays a very vital role. A lot of the fintech companies are doing that, but not just fintech companies uh, that are doing that, but also in agriculture, in health, and also my vice president here on energy. Uh, we, mm. we, we see digitalization helping on the energy sector. Um, where today you have a lot of uh, people via their mobile phones that can easily pay as you go for the use of off-grid solar-based systems. And, and I think in the last maybe two years or so, or three years, uh, more than 30-something million people have been able to buy their own uh, uh, solar systems because mm -hmm. of the pay-as-you-go system that you have because of your mobile phone. So all of that to say that markets are getting better, mm -hmm. better integrated, um, a lot more financial inclusion is happening because of uh, mobile, mobile telephony, yep. uh, for example. So I think it's a very different world that we have today, and the power of technology will only continue to make it um, uh, allow us to unlock the potentials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Shibasawa san, I understand you have a lot, lots of experience to have an interview with a startup, mostly the with me. So, <laughs> do you have any comments on him? Sure. Um, one, I think, a very important uh, aspect that the president mentioned was this Africa free trade area. Because if you think about it, coming from Japan, we can't go to all 54 countries. But if you can go to one country and you can trade out of that, uh, that's a very powerful uh, uh, um, uh, infrastructure that will be in place. Um, startups and things, you know, we heard lots of uh, solutions in energy and agriculture in the other room this morning. Uh, we talked about currently uh, digitalization, uh, manufacturing, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think in the end, we don't need frogs, right? We need people. And, and I think what's very important, I think, for Africa right now is, is the capacity building of the human capital. And so what I would recommend for the African Development Bank is to go to the Japanese government and say, hey, you know, we're, we're there. We want to promote this Africa free trade area. Um, and we're all on board with this building capacity for human capital. You know, can you help us co-create this uh, ecosystem? So, mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much. So now, now I'd like to ask Goda-san and Pareza to share information on startup businesses in Africa. And I think both of you have uh, some, you know, the request and the message for Japanese business leaders. So, Goda-san, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon again. My name is Makoto Goda. Uh, I'm a CEO of Nippon Biodiesel Fuel. Uh, thank you so much for the Ikezai Yukai and the uh, welcome to Japan for Dr. Adesina. Uh, so this is my second time to meet with Dr. Adesina. Uh, last time uh, Dr. Adesina came to Japan, uh, it's a four, four years ago maybe, uh, I was very impressed and the surprised that the, at that time I was one of the audience and the, after the seminar I just talked to him and the, 
uh, explain about my project, and he immediately uh, opened his phone and called to his staff to <laughs> say something to, to work on uh, together with me. So uh, I was so surprised and impressed. Thank you so much last time. <laughs> and today, um, I want to point out three, uh, point out three, uh, three points. And the uh, one is uh, uh, most of the uh, cases, I think the uh, funds or investors look into the uh, quick uh, growing sectors. But the, at the same time, there is uh, some uh, sectors very important for long-term strategy. And the second point uh, we are working on, the, uh, sorry, uh, my company's name is Nippon Biodiesel Fuel. This is a biofuel sector. And the, you know, the biofuel sector is a half agriculture and the half energy sector. So that's uh, my projects are uh, contaminated. Uh, but anyway, um, one uh, project uh, we are working on uh, named IPA. IPA is a uh, uh, one initiative the Japanese government committed at the TICA 7 IPA is an agricultural innovation platform in Africa. And uh, we are promoting the digital uh, value chain. And uh, also the third point, third point uh, we are uh, continuously uh, working on uh, special breeding of Jatropha. And the, there is an up and down so, uh, in the history. So um, currently, especially the aviation sector, uh, they really looking for sustainable aviation fuels and uh, there's not enough raw materials. And the, uh, talking about the uh, Jatropha, it's a kind of the tree uh, for producing the uh, biofuel raw material. And as far as I know, Africa has the biggest potential continent in the world. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. And uh, this is a uh, roadmap uh, when we started the IPA initiative in 2019. And uh, this, our, our, this initiative is uh, based on the model of JA. JA is a Japan Agriculture Cooperative. And the agriculture cooper cooperatives, is, uh, there are uh, several types. And the, we think the Japanese Agriculture Cooperative is uh, one of the unique. So they are not work, uh, only working on the agriculture sector trading and the uh, aggregation and so on. So of course they are working on. At the same time, they are working on, the, they have the banks, they have the insurance, and they also have the uh, more than 350 general hospitals in rural side of Japan. So this kind of the combination to grow up the rural side is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's also very effective for the African development. And uh, this is a, uh, one of the implementation of the IPA initiative. We e, launched our application named Agroponto uh, in Mozambique and Senegal and Nigeria. And this is a case of the uh, Mozambique. Uh, last year, we launched in April, last, last April, and the now uh, users are more than 40,000, and the transaction is 200,000 US dollar uh, plus plus. And uh, for the next step, uh, this is uh, we call the SSC, Small Smart Community. Uh, this is a concept. Uh, we are working together with the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and, uh, Forestry and Fisheries of the Japanese government. And uh, this concept is uh, based on the, uh, the, just I uh, mentioned about the JA model. So it's not only for uh, agriculture, but for rural development. And uh, we implemented one uh, feasibility trial uh, together with the one Japanese big shipping company, Mitsui OSK Line, uh, especially about the logistics. And, oh, sorry, collaboration is, ah, yeah. And the, uh, we are working, uh, that project was, is working in northern part of Mozambique. And the, there is a SAPZ uh, project of FDB in northern part of Mozambique, and so now we try to collaborate together with FDB our, uh, with our PPP project uh, of Japanese government. And, so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, this is the last. Uh, this is about uh, Jatropha biofuel breeding. So, uh, breeding is very, it takes long time. So, we started uh, 2003, and so many years we are working on, and the, compared to the uh, wild species, we have uh, achieved the 20 times more productivity uh, compared to the uh, wild species. Thanks so much. 
Thank you very much. And the Paresa? Paresa, it's your time. Hi, okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Okay, um, I'm just having common sharing, so I'll just... Um, Are you okay for the slide decks? Yeah, okay. Now looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's telling me I have to... I believe, I believe you can make a presentation without the slide decks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't have to say my slide. Okay. Um, hi, hi, everyone. My name is Kalisa. Uh, can anyone hear that um, echo? Or is it just me? Yeah, no problem for us. Please keep continuing speaking. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa, and uh, I'm a co founder at Everything. Um, we are an e marketplace where farmers, buyers, and transporters of uh, fresh produce and other agricultural products can need. Um, so, um, I wanted to start uh, by talking about uh, the landscape of agriculture in Africa. So, um, firstly, uh, African farms are said to be African farms are said to be. Oh, <laughs> oh. Um, yes. So, African farms are slightly. Too big. Like two Yes. yes. Um, African farms are said to be operating at 40% of the global capacity. For instance, with grains like wheat and rice, we are said to be producing only 10% of the global average. Yet Africa has 50% of the remaining arable land in the world. Secondly, I'm gonna talk about market access. So they say a typical African farmer has to travel about two and a half hours to reach the nearest market. In my country, South Africa, uh, there's deep inequality in market access. In 2017, six and a half percent of all farms generated 70 percent of the revenue from farming. Uh, and then we talk about infrastructure as well. Um, about uh, uh, so only five percent of Africa is equipped for irrigation. If we had to um, increase that, we could increase productivity by up to 50%. Um, please can we move forward on the slide? Sorry, oh, yes, okay. So I spoke about production. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Cool, so um, my company, AgriCool, we are an e-marketplace and we help farmers, buyers, and transporters of food to meet. Why is this an important problem? Market access is a huge challenge for African farmers. And one of the big problems is that they operate in silos. It's not easy for them to find each other. This fragmentation allows intermediaries into the space, which drives up food prices, and results in multiple handling, which is food waste. Next slide, please. So um, we are an e-marketplace. I like to say we're like a dating site for people in agriculture, since it's so difficult for them to find each other. We help um, buyers verify quality, organize transport for farmers, and also provide market intelligence for farmers so they can farm and plan better. Next, please. Um, so. I think, you know, we have uh, many wonderful um, benefits for our users, but my favorite thing, which also ties into how do we help corporates is in South Africa, and I think in the world, we have a huge problem with monopolies and over-concentration of industries. So we are helping a lot of large retailers to uh, localize their value chains. So instead of buying food a thousand kilometers away, 
we help them build up a supply base locally. And then we also help them transform to make their supply chains inclusive so that every type of farmer, small scale, large scale, commercial is included in their value chain. Um, next, please. So we have um, big partners. I'm happy to say that since December 2021, we onboarded South Africa's biggest retailer, ShopRite, as one of our, of our retailers. Even better than that is um, we recently onboarded ShopRite, who has a huge fleet of trucks, 50 plus trucks, as one of our logistics partners. So what's great about this is we're doing something called reverse logistics, meaning that Every day, ShopRite is sending out trucks all over the country and they come back empty, which is a waste of fuel and time and, and resources. So what we do is they pick up more goods on their way back, which has reduced our cost of transporting goods by 24%, um, which is quite an innovative thing that happens in the logistics sector, but it needs you to um, have a bird's eye view of where the trucks are all the time. Next, please. So we've been growing a lot. Um, our growth has been like three, four X in the past few years. Um, it slowed down a bit last year, um, but what we've been trying to do is work on increasing our margins um, from like 10% to like 25%, which is working out quite well. Next, please. So um, growth levers, what we're trying to do is uh, increase our supply base by providing finance and support for farmers, we're trying to move into grains and partner with big companies like uh, PepsiCo and Tiger Brands. Also move further into the rest of South Africa and eventually SADC. We've been talking about the free trade agreement. Hopefully um, those some of these trade uh, tariffs can lax so that we can move into these countries. And my favorite is working on research and development, developing digital tools um, and smart tools for farmers to farm better. Okay, for my last slide, uh, the last one, please. Next. Yes. So uh, Japan and Africa, um, what, where do I think um, Japan can focus some of, their, some of their resources? Obviously, I'm very biased for agriculture. So I'm going to focus on agriculture because it's the biggest, uh, um, it has the biggest potential to employ the 10 million youth entering the job market every year. So the first one is to invest in people, uh, which someone on the panel mentioned earlier. So the first one is inclusive and sustainable agricultural financing. So there's a lot of financing flowing around, um, but not all of it is inclusive. Uh, only certain types of farmers can access it and it's not sustainable. It takes a farmer about three to five seasons to actually become profitable. And sometimes you wanna give him money for one year and then if he doesn't make money, you're like, oh, bring our money back. And then next is to train and deploy extension workers. So there's one, extension worker in Africa for 3,000 3, farmers, which is ridiculous, and only 15% are women. Um, so we need to train and deploy more people to help farmers. Then lastly, investing into R&D, resource and activity mapping. Which parts of Africa are high potential, have high soil organic matter? Which parts are degraded? We need a map of the, of the continent where we can see in a snapshot what's happening. Uh, putting more uh, research into resistant and high yielding seed varieties, specifically bred for Africa. And lastly, promoting indigenous African crops and food culture, getting Africans to consume African food um, and also planting uh, indigenous African uh, crops, which are better for the soil. Um, so I think these are great opportunities. Um, thank you. Thank you, Paresa. Thank you. So, Dr. Adesina, I understand you are the president of African Development Bank, but also you are the professional professional for agriculture in Africa. So, do you have any additional comments? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, first, uh, let me commend and, and congratulate you, Vanessa, for what you're doing, and that's we need more of that. Um, you know, we can talk about power, we can talk about roads, we can talk about anything. But there's nothing more important to human existence than food. You gotta eat in the morning, you eat in the afternoon, you eat at night. But Africa, in my view, should be a global powerhouse in food and agriculture. We may not be able to manufacture airplanes yet, Maybe we've started in some places. I think Morocco, you have some assembly of things you're doing for air buses. 
But there's no reason why Africa should not be able to fill every single aircraft with food. Let me tell you what is going on, a revolution that's going on in Africa today because of our investment in agriculture as a bank. We're investing $25 billion in agriculture over 10 years as a, as a bank. First, it's in times of technology, right? I think Benassi was talking about the importance of raising productivity of agriculture. I'll give you an example of what we've done for wheat. Wheat is a temperate crop, right? But we've been able to uh, invest in R&D, in research and development, to support the development of what's called heat-tolerant wheat varieties that actually grows in heat, in hot environments, rather. And these varieties give you yields that are amazing, sometimes up to seven, eight tons per hectare in hot environments, in tropical environments. We supported Ethiopia to have access to these uh, uh, heat-tolerant wheat varieties starting in 2018. They cultivated them on 5,000 hectares, okay? Last year, they cultivated them on 1.4 million hectares. And so Ethiopia became self-sufficient in production of wheat in just three years mm -hmm. because of that technology. And this year, Ethiopia will become a net exporter of that wheat or wheat to um, mm -hmm. Djibouti and also to Kenya. Remarkable. Mm. We deployed that technology in Ni Nigeria, by the way, uh, uh, Ambassador. I was in Egypt just two weeks ago to see His Excellency President El Sisi, and I discussed this with him. And I told him that we will provide those technologies to Egypt because Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world. There's no reason why you can't take advantage of that. And I also discussed how we might even be able to use, unfortunately, Sudan is, 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 is in, a, in a crisis right now. But even for Sudan, we help Sudan with these heat tolerant varieties to reduce their wheat imports by 54% in three years. It just tells you the power of technology. That's the first thing. Mm. The second point I want to say is to make agriculture work, we need to change the labor composition of the agricultural sector. In other words, you need younger people that are in agriculture, seeing agriculture as a business, mm. not as a way of life, okay? It's a business. The, the, the richest people in the world are farmers, right? Because you've got to eat three times a day. So encouraging young people to go into agriculture as a business, the kind of things that Vanessa is talking about, I think it's very, very important. Third is financing agriculture. Mm. When we finance agriculture, we must recognize that most times that when people talk of agriculture, they just have a passive risk that's very, very high. But it's not really real. When I was, before I became Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, I brought together CEOs of 24 banks in Nigeria at the time, mm. all their chief risk officers. And I asked them, when you learn to agriculture, what is your loss rate? And I was told 98%. 100%. And I said, well, you're still working there. They should have fired you a long time ago, right? And I asked them, if you actually de-risk the agricultural value chain itself, so if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're lending to somebody producing tomatoes, you're going to lose your money because it gets rotten if they don't buy it. Mm. But if you're lending to somebody producing tomatoes, somebody buying tomatoes, somebody processing tomatoes, somebody transporting puree and things like that, you already have a system that's de-risked. Mm. And I say, so de-risk the agricultural value chain and de-risk also the financial value chains. When I became Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, we set up something called NISAL, Nigeria Incentive-Based uh, Risk Sharing for Agricultural Lending. We provided a guarantee for banks. If you lose your money, we'll pay 75% of it. Guess what? We ran it for four years. And the loss rate was less than 1%. We were able to leverage more than five times the guarantee facility we put mm. in there. So all I'm trying to say is that we need to deploy a lot of these mm -hmm. risk sharing instruments to reduce the risk, even if it is still passive risk, of lending to agriculture. Mm -hmm. Fourth is we must support women because most of the farmers that you find in Africa are women. And the main problems they have is lack of access to land and lack of access to finance. Okay. We have a program, my vice president is there, 
who runs it, is called Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, which is a new facility we have to leverage $5 billion for, for women, not just farmers, but for women in Africa. Last year we did what? A billion dollars? A billion dollars? A, we've done a billion dollars of financing for women businesses uh -huh. in Africa. The last thing I was on agriculture, and sorry for asking me because you know that's my passion. <laughs> yeah, so. It's okay. The, the last thing I've said on agriculture is infrastructure. That uh -huh. most times when people think of agriculture, they don't think of the supported infrastructure that goes, needs to go with it. Mm -hmm. You need to have roads, you need to have energy, you need to have irrigation, you need to have logistics, you need to have warehouses, you have to have processing, value addition. And that's why at the African Development Bank, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Goda mentioned it in his remarks, yep. we are supporting now what's called special agro-industrial processing zones. These are new economic zones we are developing in rural economies that are enabled with critical infrastructure, power, water, roads, mm -hmm. you know, all th kind of logistics you need so that the, the people who are the um, processors of food are located close to where those that are producing the food are. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think we're spending well over a billion dollars on that right now in many countries. What that will do and this is an area I want to encourage Japan to really invest in. What it will do will be the following. First, it will change rural areas from zones of economic misery that they are today to zones of economic prosperity. It will expand the fiscal space in most of our rural areas. It will create jobs. We will reduce the massive amount of post-harvest losses we currently have. And also, it will allow Africa to build competitive value chains. So, yeah. We are doing it in so many countries today. So those are the, in my view, we need a structural change in the agricultural sector. We mm -hmm. can't be sitting on 65% of the arable land left to feed the world and be poor at the same time. You know, we've got to turn it into, into a really mon money-making machine, but it requires technology, it requires finance, it requires land equity for farmers. It requires also that we have a structured way with special agro-industrial processing zones. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adeshina. So, Kamara-san or uh, Shibasa-san, any quick, quick comments on uh, startups? Well, nice, nice no, it's okay? Sure. Okay, so next I'd like to welcome Dr. Odiusola, uh, resident, rep uh, resident representative of UNDP South Africa. So he's providing a pragmatic information on African ecosystem and the SDGs impact investment. So, Dr. Odiusura. Yeah, thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shimura-san, and uh, all protocols of that. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you that uh, the issue of impact investment is key to aligning private sector finances into the eight African Development Bank HIFI, the African Union Agenda 2063, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, we strongly believe the impact investment is the best way to go. And some of these things relate to one of the areas just discussed now, the issue of agriculture and value chain development in that particular sector. Uh, well, you realize that uh, if you look at the global foreign direct investment uh, of 1.82 trillion in 2021, only 837 billion were in developing countries. And if you disaggregate this, 619 billion in Asia and 134 billion in Latin America and the Caribbean, only 83% in Africa which we think it's still relatively very low to what is needed. Because as of today, only 13% of impact investment needs is really meant on the continent. It really shows the potentials are high, which was estimated to almost about 1.1 trillion. And but as President Tadishino said, you don't need potential. We need the reality things on the ground. That is why we think we need to really look into some of these races, why foreign direct investment is considered to be very low in Africa. Mm. Uh, a lot of things have been put, but our findings really show that limited data and insight on investment opportunity is one of the key gaps. Uh, and in this regard, we have a, 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 a developed what they call the SDG impact investment map, 
which we have developed in 20 countries as I speak. And on the basis of this, we've been able to generate 250 investment opportunity areas, cutting across five critical sectors, the infrastructure, uh, agriculture and agro-processing, uh, health system, the educational system and renewable energy services. So these are the critical sectors where we see, and uh, what, what really thrills us in UNDP is that we have internal rate of return that ranges between 7% and 23% across some of these sectors, really showing that the investment opportunity uh, rate of return is very high in Africa relative than any other part of the world. So this is something we, we, we have done. And as a result of this, we've been able to use this to really promote business to business opportunities. We've done it in two countries where we promoted uh, startups uh, in Africa, in South Africa and Japanese companies in, in uh, 2021, where we're able to mobilize about 250 companies as matchmaking, which provided opportunity for them to, to really see their, I mean, their, their, their counterparts and at the same time leverage opportunity for finance and technical, I mean, technical alignment. Then the second one we did was also between Japanese company and companies uh, small, uh, startup companies in Ghana, which also facilitated a lot of engagement and has really led to uh, ability to mobilize about $29 million uh, to uh, these small enterprises in Ghana. But essentially what is really very important in terms of the second reason we always raise why Africa has not been able to benefit maximally from foreign direct investment relates to the issue of limited capacity and network. And this is why we promote business to business engagement. But in the area of capacity, uh, I just want to let you know that a partnership between the government of Japan, UNDP, and Toyota Saravica has created what they call uh, a kind of uh, uh, breakthrough in autom automotive skills, where it led to the establishment of a Toyota Academy, where they're focusing on training on the automotive skill of 21st century in Africa. This is something we have done, uh, and uh, we have really, really exposed a lot of young South Africans to what it takes to really make this one really happen. And also in line with this, UNDP is launching what they call African Business Alliance then, where we match startups with uh, what they call financial, I mean, uh, what they call uh, venture capital investors across the world. We've started it, uh, and thanks to METI, uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry that is partnering with us in getting this one done. We are piloting it in three countries, uh, in uh, Angola, South Africa and, and, and Zambia. So this is something we intend to really bring uh, uh, not only financial institutions like African Development Bank. I know Afrex Bank has already uh, agreed to be part of that. And I'm using the opportunity to inform uh, His Excellency President Adesino that uh, given the strategic role of ADB in Africa, it would be good for ADB to really uh, be a major, a leading actor in that particular process where we introduce African business lions then, where we prepare uh, startups and small scale enterprises to be able to meet this venture capital investor and be able to match them with it. And I strongly believe that's one of the areas we think we can do. And also to let you know that uh, part of the things we do in terms of enhancing capability in terms of inf investment opportunities is what we do. With, uh, we're currently working with Badea. This is Arab Bank for Africa's uh, economic development uh, in terms of what we have done with working with government officials in Equatorial Guinea, in Cameroon, and also in Cote d'Ivoire to really develop what they call the capacity to develop bankable projects. Uh, for to, to for uh, banks to be able to meet some of these uh, requirements of the banks. So this is what we are doing, and we've mobilized. We've mobilized just 20 million uh, for uh, uh, for Cameroon and 18 million for Equatorial Guinea, and we're doing so. And also in terms of the value chain development that the president mentioned, uh, the rise value chain development in the Sahel. We're currently working with the Islamic Development Bank to really promote this in terms of making sure that young Africans are fully involved in rise value chain development. So this is something which I strongly believe is really very important for us to really promote this. The SDG impact investor map is really creating opportunity for us to let us know 
uh, that there are many investment opportunities that can sustain uh, development for a very long time. Uh, but we need to do it in partnership with relevant actors. And thanks to the government of Japan, thanks to uh, Meiji, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry that are really working with us in this area. But I just want to mention the issue of leveraging Africa and Japan comparative advantages. Japan is known for its strong capacity in science, technology and innovation. And as uh, President Additional mentioned, uh, Africa has a lot of opportunity in terms of the youthfulness of the continent, where you have, over, I mean, population less than 30 percent, uh, about 64, uh, 30 years old, about 64 percent of the population, and they are digitally inclined. And I strongly believe partnership around that area will help us to really unlock some of these development uh, issues, and also to really see how can we work together. Uh, the uh, ADB is there on the issue of e-payment, e-commerce, and I'm sure Palesa has mentioned it, because we have to leverage the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's really very important for us to really see how we can leverage the opportunities that are really itself in Africa and throw it into uh, what they call development transformation and the engine room of growth and development on the continent. The partnership with Japan is key, and the private sector have a strong role to play in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let's get down to presentation by Kawamura-san. Kawamura-san, please. <clears throat> thank you, Shimoda-san. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to have this opportunity to give presentation today. What I'd like to present is Marubeni's business profile in Africa. To start, Marubeni has 13 offices throughout Africa with 30 Japanese expat employees. Now, let me introduce some of our long-term businesses in Africa. We have been participating in an energy production business in Equatorial Guinea, as well as floating production storage and floating facility business in Ghana. In addition, we have been exporting coffee beans from Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya, and have, have been engaged in automobile sales distribution business in Ghana for many years. Next, I would like to mention about uh, three large infrastructure projects in Angola, Marubeni took up the challenges of rehabilitating three textile factories, which amounts about one billion US dollar, uh, supported by JBIC Finance. These factories are currently operated by private companies and have created vital employment opportunities in Angola. Here, let me introduce power plant projects. In Kenya, we constructed Orekaria Geothermal power plant completed last year. In Nigeria, Marubeni has a long track record in construction of power plants, and the power generation capacity of these plants now accounts for more than 40% of Nigeria's power supply. Here, you can see a water sector project we are engaged in. In South Africa, we are involved in wastewater treatment and recycling business. We have a great deal of experience in this field, and will continue to work on solving water-related social issues. Marubeni is also working with startups in Africa. In 2018, we joined Japanese startup, startup Washa as a strategic partner in its off-grid power business. We are currently operating in Tanzania, Uganda, Mozambique, and other countries with a total beneficiary base of about 5 million people. We also participated in LPG delivery business to which contributes clean cooking as solid fuel like wood or coal cause pollution and mal-effect to the health of households. In addition to all of this, we are also participating in fund that invests in companies focusing on healthcare sector in Africa. As you can see over time, our business has diversified as well as changed in form. However, our desire to solve social issues in Africa through our business has not been changed at all. We particularly intend to focus on two areas in future in Africa, green business and healthcare business. This covers a lot, though. That's concluded my short presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kamala san So I realized through my interview with African startups, there is a large gap between African entrepreneurship and the Japanese corporate culture. And I think you know, the African entrepreneurs are always focusing on so-called agile project management 
and not afraid to take risks. But in contrast, the Japanese companies are always a very, how can I say, Japanese companies are sensitive about taking risks. And uh, they always take their time in making decisions. And uh, it sometimes appears to be very sluggish to African people. So, Kamara-san, I'm wondering how Marbeni can work together with African startups. Uh, it's really a good point, Shimoda-san. We all know that uh, there is a great potential in Africa, and startups with new business models have been growing where Japanese companies can work together. However, I think that many Japanese companies are a bit hesitant to go into the market because most of us still have a sort of general perception that Africa is geographically and culturally different, uh, distant from Japan and takes time till monetization mm -hmm. and then too risky. Our challenge, I think, would be that the first, we need to learn more about Africa going there. Secondly, we should learn more about market requirement as well as business model. Then lastly, we should well align with the management of, of startups. It often happens that quick decision and pivoting of the business model are required, which we are not very familiar with. One example of what we are currently doing is that uh, we participate in startups at minor level of equity, the first. At the same time, sending our people into the management and get to know business models as mm -hmm. well as the management style better. Then after comfortably aligning with the management, we provide additional equity to take larger role and make a larger contribution to the company. And I also think that one way to get to know African startup better is by indirectly investing in startups through funds, like what Shibusa-san is now setting up. That's uh, what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's very important, you know, the, not only you know the invest in Africa, but also you know the learn something from Africa. Yes. Mm. Thank you so much. So let's turn our attention to and capital. So Shibsa san uh, why do you think the impact fund can create a new flow of capitals uh, from Japan to Africa? Um, thank you, Shibsa san I think I had a presentation PowerPoint. If you could get that up for me, thank you. Um, well, okay. Um, I think I might have mentioned that I think the potential for Africa, <clears throat> the opportunity for Africa will only be realized if there's execution. And for execution, you need people. And so our thesis for our impact fund is the co-creation of people-centric impact fund. This, this, is, this is our thesis. Um, why do we think that our impact fund will be successful? Uh, is, is one is I think we have some great partners, and I can't. Can, can you go forward? This doesn't work. Oh well, you can you can just look at my pretty face, and <laughs> I'll just speak. <laughs> Uh, um, we, we have some great uh, partners, in, in starting with the, the Africa Development Bank. Um, you know what? Uh, and and um, so, so we started this partnership, as I mentioned in my open remarks. And if you look at our shareholders, um, it's not by the Keizai Doyukai, but it's by the members of the Keizai Doyukai. So if you look at our shareholders um, in blue, it's basically the Africa project team. Um, in, in orange, it's the president, the, the prior president uh, of the, uh, the Keizai Doyukai. Um, and if you look at our people, <clears throat> um, um, actually, myself, my co-founder, uh, Akira Sato, he's an experienced uh, 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 m and specialist and, uh, uh, and, and, fund, um, and fund investor. Um, and if you look at our senior management, Mr. Iwai and Mr. Shiga uh, and Mr. Ono, um, we're all a part of the Africa project team. So we have a very experienced team in the management team. 
Um, and if you look at <clears throat> the people, um, actually there's lots of uh, empty spaces <laughs> there. But actually, uh, guess what? We're, we're hiring. <laughs> uh, we're hiring for talent uh, in the area of um, um, impact investing and also in, in the execution of the fund. Um, so um, if there's anybody out there, I see, I see, see some young talent in, in the audience, uh, people uh, looking at us at, at the, um, in the, uh, uh, through the online, if you're interested in working with us, um, Mr. Asato is there in the audience and he'd be very, very happy to uh, speak with you. Um, of course, we're a fund, so we need to be looking at the, uh, you know, achieving the market rate of return I'm sorry, this doesn't work. So, um, and and um, and we also need to actually uh, answer to the social. Uh, I'm sorry, the social uh, issues that faces the African continent, and we need to do this with with impact, basically. Um, the, the this part is not so much new, but I think the fact that we have relationship through the Keizai do Yukai at senior levels of many many large corporations. Um, and not just like financial institutions, but uh, local social the trading companies, um, manufacturers uh, with technology, uh, retail, uh, logistics, <clears throat> all this. And so I think if we put it all together, um, I think we have a, uh, a solution for the, for the African continent that, that's probably appealing for us. Um, if you can go forward with the slides over there. Um, the areas that we'll be investing in is actually, when I say people-centric, you need to be looking at the global health, the health sector. <clears throat> uh, we talked about nutrition and agriculture. That's another important area. Um, obviously, you need logistics to support the health and uh, agriculture. Um, we would be looking at um, also the uh, sustainable energy <clears throat> that's needed to, to power the, the, the continent. And also, as I mentioned, we're a people-centric fund, so we need to be looking at the human capital side of it, so possible education and, and, and vocational uh, training. And all of this will need to have financing embedded, I believe, into the solutions, and all of this will be obviously be, uh, be enabled by technology. Um, so you know that, that that's our basic you know uh, proposal to the to to um, to the uh, uh, to the KSI, members of the KSI do Yukai and also for the African continent. Uh, we'll be investing directly into uh, startups um, in the post A round and, and the growth stage, um, and also through funds <coughs> uh, with already established track records. Uh, in, in the impact space. Why this is important is because that leads us uh, as, a, as a robust pipeline for direct investments, which we can have uh, in our collaboration with our LPs, which, uh, as I mentioned, will be the members of the KSI do Yukai. Thank you. Just a question. So, Shibisa, Shibisa, you mentioned you know, that you will invest in healthcare, agriculture, and uh, education, including human capitals. Uh, by measuring and managing the impact. So which country are you exactly are you planning to invest in? All African countries well, it, at once or? Uh, well, well, well hmm. we, we say it's a pan-African strategy, but realistically most of the, I think I believe like 75% of the venture capital investments have gone into what we call the big four, uh, which would include the, Nigeria, uh -huh. uh, South Africa, Kenya, and, and Egypt. But at the same time, those markets, I would imagine, would be, tend to be overcrowded if 75% of the money is going there. And so I think the other regionals, uh, you know, like Senegal on the, on the west side, um, um, I think Tanzania, some people mention, is, is a very, very uh, uh, upcoming uh, nice place <laughs> to invest. Um, you know, and, and, and Rwanda is always up in, in there for, for technology, uh, as a technology hub. And so, you know, we'll be looking at different um, com com countries throughout. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Adesina, can I ask you a quick comment of Shibisawa-san? <laughs> yeah, you know, I just wanted to come back to what he was saying earlier on about the importance of skills, because I think it doesn't really matter what you're trying to do with venture capital funds. You need bodies, you need minds, you need people. So, um, the, the bank is, is, is working on this in many ways. Uh, we're supporting a lot of work in Africa today um, with universities, centers of excellence on science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, which is very critical in today's digital world that you're talking about. 
to being able to, to function. That's mm -hmm. the job of tomorrow. The other one that we're doing, which is more linked to the fintech industry, um, has to do with the capacity to code, because coding is the currency of tomorrow. And um, we're helping to set up today uh, 130, we plan to set up actually, 130 coding centers all across Africa, to, together with Microsoft, mm -hmm. with LinkedIn, um, and others. And this will allow them to be able to have the skills that they need to be able to code, um, which is very important. We already have some of this already in Rwanda, for example, we have in, in Senegal, in Cote d'Ivoire, and in, um, in Nigeria. But also building the entrepreneurship, it's critical. Mm. And so the bank is also supporting uh, innovation and entrepreneurship hubs, um, which essentially will give them all the ecosystem they need to be able to develop their entrepreneurship skills. And mm -hmm. we hope to be able to use that to develop about 50,000 entrepreneurs by 2024, mm -hmm. right? And in terms of the coding, we want to do about 230,000 coders uh, for, for Africa. And the last thing I want to say is, um, you know, you, you need the skills, you need the uh, digital skills in particular, you need entrepreneurship, but then you need the finance, right? And so at scale for young people, when young people go to, to the banks in Africa, you walk in, the only thing they see is risk, right? You see just risk. Because that's because the financial ecosystem has not really developed for young people, right? Um, and so to, to deal with many of those issues, the African Development Bank is developing and rolling out actually what's called Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks. These are gonna be new financial institutions that we are developing across Africa that will develop a new financial ecosystem for businesses of young people to thrive in Africa. Look, I'm president of the African Development Bank and if there's something that makes me ashamed, it's the fact that our young people are leaving Africa. Why? You know, I don't believe the future of Africa is utilized in Europe. It doesn't lie in Asia. It doesn't lie in Latin America. It doesn't lie in the United States. It must lie in Africa growing well, growing equitably, skilling up its young people, but giving the finance for them to be able to turn their business ideas, uh, into, I mean, to ideas into real grow businesses. But if you can't support their businesses, they will just simply remain that. So the bank, African Development Bank, is now going to be doing this. These new financial institutions will finance the business of young people in the life cycle of their businesses. So it's not that we find it today, it finances today and tomorrow you don't get financing. So it will deploy a series of instruments. Technical assistance support will be critical. Business development services will be, will be critical. Debt and equity financing. But in the life cycle of your business so that we can grow it. And the reason is because I fundamentally believe we must grow youth-based wealth in Africa. You know, and, and the way to do that is to make sure we're putting our financial muscle behind young people. We trust them, but let's make sure that you know, they are not um, uh, being marginalized because of lack of access to uh, financing. Okay, thank you very much. So panelists, thank you very much for joining us for what was an interesting and informative discussion. So there will be 10 to 15 minutes till the end of this session. So I'd like to move on to the Q and A's. はい、えー、それでは、えー、質疑応答に入りたいと思います、えー、質問者の方あの日本人の方がね多いかなと思いまして私もちょっとリラックスしたいので、えー、ここから日本語で運営させてください、えー、まず会場で、えー、ご質問やご意見のある方恐縮ですが挙手をしていただけますでしょうかはいじゃあどうぞ。Thank you very much for your uh, very impressive uh, lectures. Uh, I am Ms. Adachi, the head of Tokyo office, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development. I have one question to Dr. Uh, Adi Sina or Mr. Adi uh, Shibusawa. Um, I'm interested in, hi, <laughs> I'm interested in um, investment among uh, African countries. If uh, investment among African countries uh, active? Uh, if it is yes, then which area such, a active, uh, such investment is uh, active? And uh, are such area different from area in which Japanese companies invest? <laughs> Makes sense? Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Adishina, 
Yes. Yeah, no, sure. Um, I think we often talk about the, the foreign direct investment. We don't talk enough about Africa to Africa investment. And in fact, quite a lot of what you see, whether it's in food and ag businesses, it's done between African countries of themselves. Um, you know, light manufacturing is a big one in which Africans invest across uh, uh, to each other. And, and um, Africa to Africa investment has been helped tremendously because of some of what we are doing in terms of integrating capital markets across countries. So which means you can pull capital and be able to invest across, uh, across other countries. And um, I also wanted to say that we, we have um, a way in which we want to, we are pulling African countries to invest in other places through a forum we have, which is called the Africa Investment Forum. Now that investment forum brings together project developers, it brings together financiers, it brings together everybody in Africa. It's ourselves, the African Development Bank, and, and Africa, Africa Exim Bank, Trade and Development Bank, and several others. And we bring them all together to look at infrastructure investments in energy, in digital infrastructure, um, in food and ag, in health sector, and so on, many others. So, but I just wanted to say that this uh, Africa Investment Forum has been able in the last three forums that we've had, uh, mobilize $110 billion of investment interest in Africa, right? Um, so that's very, very critical. And I would like to invite most of the people here to our next Africa Investment Forum session that's gonna be held in your country, Ambassador, in Morocco. Uh, from the second, I think the second to the fourth uh, of uh, November, eight to ten. It's eight to the ten um, um, in uh, in uh, Morocco. Uh, that's going to be important. So a lot needs to be done to also build what my vice president uh, Solomon called what he called Africa, Afro champions, African champions. For example, I give you I give you two big examples. You know, take for example cement. Right? Aliko Dangote in Nigeria. You know, it's the largest investor in cement in Africa, and it's opened up cement factories all across Africa. Um, you also see, for example, uh, the whole area of fertilizers. You go to Morocco, for example, you have the OCPA in Morocco, which has the world's largest phosphate company, invested in several African countries. You know, so you, you, can, see, you can see that. You also can see, for example, take even South Africa, South Africa is Africa's most industrialized economy, but it's investing also in automobile industry in different parts of Africa. Uh, Morocco, for example, on energy, is investing in helping us actually in, 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 the, in the Sahel uh, with renewable energy in terms of solar and so on. So there's quite a lot that goes on between Africa to Africa uh, investment that we often don't talk quite a lot about, but most of, it, of the trade you see in Africa today is a lot between African countries and it can only get bigger and better uh, with the Africa continental free trade area. Okay, thank you so much. Sure, um, I think you know, most of the recent uh, investment into Africa in venture capital, I would think most of the money, actually most of the performance have probably come from FinTech, which is very, very important. But um, in the end, if you just take a, let's say a typical Silicon Valley model into Africa, I'm thinking, well, you probably need people to execute on that model. And, and I think maybe some venture capitalists start finding out maybe that's not the same as Silicon Valley. Um, and and um, so I go back to my point about the people-centric, uh, you know, building the, uh, the capacity of, you know, human capital. Um, um, you know, agriculture, um, I learned a lot today, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big uh, provider of, uh, you know, employment in, in Africa. And I think most of the people are actually farmers. And guess what? We we in Japan we're farmers. <clears throat> Basically, we're an agricultural society. Uh, 150 years ago, we were able to use that sort of baseline and use the human capital part of the equation to join the ranks of the advanced nations of the time. So I think we have some some message or some ideas that we can take to Africa um, for the for the African people to actually implement on. You know, we're just, we're just a, you know, a, a small company with limited resources, so we need to find partners and find leverage points um, you know, where, where we can grow on that, uh, on that thesis, I think. So thank you very much. はい、ありがとうございました。えっと、他にご質問ある方いらっしゃいますか。できれば日本人の方にもっと積極的にお発言いただきたいですが、いかがでしょう。
ちょっとあのじゃあねネットでウェビナーの方でえっ、ー、とご質問をいただいているので先にね日本人の方からいただいてんこれどれだっけあこれですねちょっとあのウェブの方で質問いただいているので、えー、紹介させてくださいえっ、ー、とねちょっと長文なのでごめんなさい若干短くしますけれどもえっ、ー、と SDGs のゴールは2030年です。ただ、まあ、その SDGs2030 年までにはです、ねえー、なかなかこう達成できそうもないとで、長期の視点でアフリカの可能性を語るのも大事なんですけれども、えーまあ、ターゲット国や分野をです、ね、戦略的に絞って、その実現に向けて、まあ、日本がまあ集中的に協力、サポートしていくという考えも、アプローチもあるのではないかと思いますが、この。案にコメントはありますかというご質問ですがいかがでしょうこれ川村さんにお願いしてもいいですかまあそのまあアフリカといっても54カ国あって広いので,で、ねはい、まあその SDGs2030 年達成という観点に向けてまあどっか国を絞って戦略的に取り組んでいくのもありではないかというご質問ではないかと思いますがあのー本質的にどうかというのは横に置くとやっぱりあの、えー、いわゆる仕事のしやすさ、まあ、投資協定があるあるいは税制がこの辺の課題を日本の企業が出ていくときにこれはなかなかあのすぐ消せないという点もあると思います。したがいましてあのやはりある程度えー、先駆的な、まああのまあ、例えば投資するときにワンストップショッパーが設置されているとか、うんうん、投資しやすい国、ここはあのまず一定のスクリーンというか、ハードルがあるのかなとは思います、ただ、あの一方で、やはりあのこう SDGs という観点からしますと、あのまあ、グリーン含めましてです、ねうんうん、いろんな分野が広がりますので、まずそういった国でやってみて、その成功の事例を隣国に広げていく。とというアプローチは一つあるのかなと、うんえー、は感じます、はい、渋沢さんはあれですか、そのアンドキャピタルですけど、やっぱりアフリカこう全体をやっていくという考えなんですか、それとも最初はやっぱりどこか集中的にああのもちろん、目指すのは全体ですけれども、うんえーあのまあ、限界がありますので、はい、当然、先ほど話したように、レバレッジポイントが大切だと思いますので、うん、じゃあ、そのレバレッジポイントがあるそのあの国、えー、パートナー、どちらかというと、国というより、ちゃんとした、ちゃんと我々が信頼できる、お互いが信頼関係をできるパートナーがどこにいるか、うん、そっちの方が大事なんじゃないかと思うんですね、うんうん、はい、えー、他会場からご質問、何かありますでしょうか。はいいいじゃあお願いいたします、okay, please go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is Glory Siwale and I am from Malawi. I was with the Japan African Dream Scholarship. I just finished my internship with a company called Tayo Yuka. It is a company which produces biofertilizer and focuses on micro franchising in Africa. So, my question or comment dates back to the first presentation, the first lecture by Dr. President Adesina.、Um, During my search for an internship company, I had to look for a company which is interested in working in Africa or which is interested in Africa, investing in Africa, which was not an easy task because maybe we do not have this kind of platform. But、um, uh, my, pla my plea or comment would be that Japanese companies that are interested in Africa should take、um, the opportunity or should capitalize on. The internship program that this scholarship provides. And which, I mean, this internship will also be a bridging platform, a bridge between the Japanese company with the African Development Bank as well as、um, Africa in general. And so the African Development Bank will also take this as an opportunity to bridge Africa with different Japanese companies. Thank you so much. Yes, so Dr. Adeshina. Yeah, I just wanted just to make two, two comments. I, and congratulations, we're proud of you and, and, and also proud of the fact that、uh, the government of Japan has supported you with a dream so, so that your dreams can come through. So、um, that's great. Now, I wanted to comment on the, on the issue raised earlier on the, on the SDGs、um, and whether you can achieve the SDGs by just focusing on a few countries. I think that's impossible. I think you achieve SDGs everywhere. And then you have to calibrate your instruments to be able to do that. For example, if you look at most of the countries that are the least 
or the low-income countries, we have at the African Development Bank what's called the African Development Fund, which is the fund that we use to support their development. They find it very difficult to get access to concessional financing. And I'm delighted that we had our 16 replenishment of that fund, where we raised a record $8.9 billion uh, for them, okay, which is the highest in the history of the fund in 50 years. And, and Japan uh, was one of the biggest uh, supporters of that fund with $534 million uh, for the 16 replenishment of the fund. Now, you hear people talk about, well, you know, don't go into these particular countries because they are very risky, uh, like Niger, Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso. Well, it's actually not true. If you know your neighborhood, you're not scared of your neighborhood. I'm not saying there are no challenges. Let me give you an example. The African Development Bank has a fund that we call private sector fund uh, facility. That facility supports when the bank makes investment in areas that are very risky, very fragile, and so on. We're making those investments. I think the fund is about $500 million now. We're making those investments, and, the, and the, not a single one of them has failed, defaulted. Okay, so sometimes when people say particular areas are just challenging, just because you don't know the place, you don't have staff on the ground, you haven't done business there. So I think no one should be, should be left behind. That's the, that's the main thing about, I mean, about uh, the SDGs. For us as an institution, because you were asking, you know, should you just focus on, 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 on particular uh, sectors or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, take us, for example, our, our, our plan for Africa is called High Fives, Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Industrialize Africa, Integrate Africa, and Improve the Quality of Life of the People of Africa. Those High five strategies of the bank, uh, UNDP, I think we have one of the UNDP staff on the, on, the, on, the call, on, the, on the video, did an independent analysis of those High Fives priorities that the bank is working on. And what did they find? They found that if Africa achieves these high fives that I've just mentioned, it will have achieved 90% of the sustainable development goals. And it will have achieved 90% of also Agenda 2063, which is the Africa that we want. So we have to continue to invest at scale in energy. We have to continue to invest at scale in agriculture so we can actually make sure nobody goes hungry. We have to invest in water and sanitation invest a lot in making sure there's financial inclusion so that women and young people can have access to finance and invest in critical infrastructure. See, so have massive amount of deficits on infrastructure, you know, so that you can have improved transport, you can have improved power transmission, all of these things. So I don't think it's a question, we, we don't have the luxury of picking what, whatever we want. I think we just have to make sure that we all work together at scale and accelerate the development uh, of, of, of Africa. And, if I can give two, two, three examples quickly, you know, our work on agriculture alone in the last five, six years has allowed us to provide technologies for over 74 million farmers uh, with, with good technologies, 30 million for, uh, people in terms of access to, to uh, electricity, mm -hmm. and in terms of input transport, probably more than 65 million people in terms of improved transport. So we just have to continue to do this because these are the things that will make sure that we achieve Agenda 20, uh, 2063 mm -hmm. and, and, and sustainable developing goals. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atisina and uh, Keza Doyukai. I have a half question and to uh, Shibusawa-san and a half uh, comment about my organization. And I'm from uh, Global Environment Center Foundation, and we are a secretary at of uh, Joint Credit Mechanism, which is another part, another uh, form of uh, impact fund. Uh, Shibusawa-san, do you think about uh, uh, new energy sources, renewable energy sources, which is directly uh, uh, related with high, uh, five, uh, high, uh, high fives. And uh, because a joint credit mechanism can be, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a subsidy from Men environment of, uh, uh, Ministry of Environment. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Okay, a half answer is, is easy. Yes, because obviously having energy is, is vital to the livelihood of the African continent and its people. So uh, in terms of the investment, um, uh, the actual investments into it, um, as I mentioned, we're in a startup and uh, in the growth stage. And so if there is a company that is catalytic, catalytic in terms of providing solutions uh, of energy, uh, in, you know, in, into throughout the continent. Obviously, they would, they would be uh, on on the um, on our agenda in terms of a potential candidate as investment. So, thank you. Do you also need some comments from Dr. Tessina? No. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, please, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, have your co uh, comment from Adesina-san. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think um, uh, Mr. Chibisawa has uh, said it all. It's, in today's world, you cannot power the world without renewable energy. Um, you know, so whether it's wind, whether it is solar, whether it's geothermal, whether it is, um, you know, hydropower, uh, the key is, is how to make sure that um, you can actually develop bankable projects that can be financed because it's, it's not, the need is massive, but often the need, the, the issue is you don't have necessarily the bankable projects enough to do that. And one of the things that we are doing is we have a project facility, project preparation facility at the bank that allows us to support preparation of those projects. Second is renewable energy is not going to go far unless you can get concessional financing for it, right? And so I think a lot needs to be done in blended finance, making sure that we can support quite a lot of that. Uh, the third is, um, we were talking about this just uh, kind of, you know, on the, on the other side there, about um, aggregating models to make renewable energy projects work. Uh, in most cases, if you don't have ways of aggregating them, they don't get so economically viable. And so there has to be something to be done at scale in aggregating many of these things uh, to get them to work. Uh, but there's no doubt about it that we must have energy transition. Um, but we have to make sure that energy transition is a pragmatic energy transition. It's not as if you turn off the light and suddenly you turn it back on and the world changes, right? So there are those countries that have coal. There are those countries that have gas. The critical thing in energy is to have an energy mix that allows you to stabilize your energy system access affordability and, and security or stability of energy is very critical. The point I'm trying to make is that renewable energy will play a big role, but let's not fool ourselves. Renewable energy alone, it's not enough. We really have to be, in the case of Africa, for example, take the case of gas, right? I know many people get so ideological when it comes to gas, but I'm not, I'm very pragmatic about it. The fact is that you need natural gas to be able to combine with variable energy sources like wind, uh, uh, hydro, even hydro that used to be very, very stable um, energy sources is no longer even stable anymore because of drought uh, in, in most of the cases. So we need to have an energy mix that allows us to do, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. And finally is that for us as a bank, just to be clear, how much are we putting in renewable energy now? 87%, right? Yeah, 87% of all of our financing is in renewable energy. But I do recognize that we need to uh, see it as transition. We need to have pragmatic solutions that work for people. And we need to stabilize our greed. It is not just about giving me light. I need power to be able to industrialize the economies. And so you need to have um, an energy mix that includes um, renewable energy, but also in the case of Africa, I think gas is fundamental for that. さんくすべりまちんでいす。さんくすべりまちんでいす。はい、え、ちょっとそろそろ、え、時間がね、え、なってし、残念ながら時間になってしまいました。ちょっと10分ほどオーバーしてしまいました。申し訳ありませんでした